it. Hello, everybody. Today, we are diving into this topic of radical self-acceptance. And in case you have not heard this in a while or from any bun, you are exactly who you're meant to be. Joining me to break this down is my amazing guest, Jem Fuller. Jem is a conscious communication coach and author of What Matters Most and The Art of Conscious Communication, a series. I'm very excited to have Jem here with us to share his story and experiences on this topic. So without further ado, welcome Jem to the podcast. Thank you so much, Paris. I've been so excited. When I came across you, I listened to some of your episodes and I was like, oh, wow, I've got to get on that podcast. I really want to meet this person and have a chat with her. So here we are. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited. I, I feel the same way about you. Like I remember you guys, we got connected on this amazing website app platform and I was just reading, like looking at his website. I'm like, so exciting because this is a topic I feel you guys, we can all relate to uh, when, we, when we're talking about radical self-acceptance and what that means, what that looks like, what does that mean to accept who you are, where you are and all these things. So I was like, I couldn't think of a better person to bring on for you guys than Jem to get into this. So before we dive on into this, I'd love if you could just, um, you know, share a little bit more about who you are and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, look, I mean, I guess starting with the end where, where, where I am now, which is not the end, obviously it's the journey, but where I am today is working as an exec and senior leader coach. I've got clients in government and private and the not-for-profit sectors. So that keeps me nice and busy. I've also been running leadership retreats in the remote Himalayan mountains and the jungles of Northern Bali for about, well, seven years before the last couple of years where we couldn't travel mm -hmm. much. Um, yeah. So that's what I do now, but leading up to this, it's been a really wild journey. Um, you know, and even when I look back over my life and all the different places I've lived and all the different things I've done, I'm like, did I really fit that all in? How did I do that? <laughs> it's been everything from a traditional global tattooist to fire dancer to kindergarten teacher and volunteer in the third world. And I spent many years wandering barefoot with dreadlocks and a long beard around Asia and, um, <laughs> and also corporate leadership. And, you know, I had that when, when I had kids. Uh, quite some time ago, my oldest boy is about to turn 18. So that was a oh. while ago. But um, yeah, so when kids came along, I thought, wow, I better get some sort of career. And I, I ended up working for a, an international travel company. And, and then the last few years of that was in senior leadership. And that's where I got introduced to coaching and neuro-linguistic programming and human behavioral profiling and all the stuff that um, I found really fascinating. So after a wild and colorful um, kind of life around the world, I ended up back here in Australia and, and now I run my own coaching practice. Wow. That you have had quite the life. That is so cool and exciting. Just hearing you talk about all these different things and places you've been and just, it's so amazing. Cause I mean, there's so many lessons in there and so much value and I can't wait for you to just get into that. So I'd love to kind of hear like, how did you, so I feel like with this work that you're, when we're talking about radical self-acceptance, what does that mean? What does radical self-acceptance mean? Um, I mean, look, really, it is, it is a, a coming to okayness with reality, mm -hmm. right? So let's just come back to reality. And I'd like to explain it like this. If we could take a snapshot in time, right? If we could freeze time right now, you are exactly who you're supposed to be, apparently, mm -hmm. because there you are, right? <laughs> just the way you are with all your stuff all your bits and bobs, all your imperfections, everything, just the way you are. And people say, well, how do you know I'm exactly who I'm supposed to be? And I borrow the lines from um, a wonderful woman who I love to follow, uh, Byron Katie, her name is, and she says, mm -hmm. reality told me, right? Because there you are and that's reality. So you must be meant to be like this because that's the way you are. Mm -hmm. And this is radical self-acceptance. And this was the biggest piece for me. I had a midlife crisis slash awakening in my early 40s and um, this midlife kind of massive turnaround ended up in me losing just about everything except for my kids I lost my career I lost my marriage I lost my house I lost pretty much everything except I got to keep my teenage boys 50 50 which was beautiful mm -hmm. and what happened through this period of time was I realized that 
for the first half of my life, I'd been running this racket, this subconscious belief that I wasn't enough, Mm -hmm. right? I wasn't good enough. And so because I had this belief that I wasn't good enough, you know, I would attract that to me. And if things were going well, I'd sabotage them because I didn't believe that I Mm -hmm. deserved them to be so good. So I had to really um, undo that belief and replace it with a new belief, which is, do you know what? I am enough. I'm exactly who I'm supposed to be. This whole radical self-acceptance piece. I shouldn't be more like anybody else. Why? Because I'm not. I'm not anybody else. I'm me. So I've got, uh, here I am just the way I am. And just that piece, you know, and this took a lot of work, Paris. You know, Mm -hmm. I didn't just kind of click my fingers and all of a sudden rewire you know, this was when I was 42. And so I had 42 years of wiring that I had to kind of undo. So it it took um, dedication. I woke up every single day over the course of a year. And I said out loud so many times to myself, I am enough. I am enough. I am enough over and over again until the neurons wired together (laughs) and it became a belief. And then I actually believed it. And then I was like, oh my God, of course I'm enough. How could I not be? (laughs) Right. And then seriously, Paris, my life changed. You know, I, I started doing my vocational work you know the work I do I is my it's my sweet spot it's what I'm here to do and I've got so much work I've got abundance I've got beautiful Mm -hmm. relationships with my kids I've got a new relationship when I say new we've been together six years now but a beautiful conscious relationship Um, I do wonderful work all around the world blah 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 so I don't want to go on too much about me but everything changed and I really believe that it changed because of radical self-acceptance. Mm, that's so beautiful. And especially just hearing you touch on the aspect of belief when you talked about that belief, right? And how the words you used to say to yourself, and then like you said, getting into that space of I am enough and continuing to repeat that to where you broke that old cycle. Because I feel mm. like that is something, just hearing you talk about all of that, I relate so much to that because that's exactly how I used to be and used to live. And I feel like, you know, a pretty similar path to you, you know, when you got into this work of, you know, really wanting to like grow and learn mm. more about yourself and just improve and get better. You know, what, what have you, what, what lesson, if, if you could give me one of the most powerful lessons you've learned so far in this journey personally, right? So we'll touch on also like the work that you do with other people as well, but for you personally, the most powerful lesson you've learned from radical self-acceptance, what is that lesson? That the most important relationship for me to nurture and to take care of is the relationship with self. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's that's wow. the biggest thing for me. And how did you, so in discovering that, is there like a certain, cause I remember you talked about having, you know, like the midlife crisis where you experience all these things, right? Losing, you know, the, the house, the relationship and all of these things. So was that the moment for you of when you started getting into radical self-acceptance or was there a different moment? Look, I, I mean, I think everything is a conglomeration of mm-hmm. all of the experiences we've had throughout our life, right? And every everything plays into it. And then with the benefit of hindsight, we can look back and, and get some clarity around, you know, the experiences that we've had and the lessons that we've learned from them. This this midlife, you know, it was it was a spiritual experience that I had. I um I was in a North American Indian sweat lodge on traditional Aboriginal Australian. Um, land here in Australia and I was in a sweat with a group of brothers that we we've been sitting in men's circle for a long time we sit around a fire and and talk about themes anyway this night we were having a sweat and I had an out-of-body experience and it was probably something to do with the you know the heat and and the, <laughs> and the trance and and what we were doing but I I was out of body and I was five years old and it was a really quite a joyful experience mm-hmm. and as a five-year-old everything was free. It was my time of innocence. There was an event that happened when I was six. When I was six, my dad lost his temper and threw me around the bedroom. He scared the shit out of me, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Sorry for swearing on your podcast. No, you're fine. No, you're okay. totally fine. <laughs> okay. So he, he scared the bejesus out of me and um, when I was six. And that, that um, was the time when I started to think, maybe I'm not good enough, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm not good enough for the most important man, the man on the pedestal, my father, right? 
So that's when I started to run this thing of I'm not enough. But prior to that, when I was five, I didn't even have that. I was just beautifully innocent. So I went back to when I was five in this spiritual experience. And then that night I had a really prophetic dream. There was a serpent in the dream and I needed to get the serpent out. And I didn't really know what it meant. But in the morning I realized, oh my God, the serpent was this belief that I've had deep in my core Mm. my whole life that I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I just started reading books. I didn't know anything about coaching back then. I didn't know anything about NLP or neuroplasticity and how we can actually change our our neural wiring. Mm -hmm. And so I just went crazy and started reading a whole bunch of books and I went, I think I can do this, you know, just through repetition, just through firing these neurons over and over again, perhaps I can re-brainwash my self-belief. Wow. And so I went to work and for the first six months of doing it, Paris, I still didn't even believe it. I was just saying it out <laughs> loud, but I didn't actually believe it. And then slowly it started to become a reflex thought. It became mm. a belief, you know, and now that I've wow. wired this belief, I, I kind of shake my head and go, I can't, I still can't fathom that I actually used to think I wasn't enough, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Wow. And- no. Okay. I love that you said that. Cause that's how I literally had that exact same experience, you know, looking back and being like, how did I live so long of my life feeling like that? And then yeah. I feel like it's almost like you're almost like separated so much from it because you, yeah. you know, you've done all these things, right. That you talk about. And that's what I love to bring to the podcast is like featuring the solutions, right. And like yeah. what we can do to get better and just grow from these experiences. So like you talked about reading a lot of books and that's something for me that I've done as well. And I know a lot of people listening probably do the same thing, right? Research, reading more books, listening to more podcasts, you know, getting into like looking at your life, right? And like you said, that dream of where you had the serpent and you're like, okay, this is what this represents of this belief that I'm not good enough. And then connecting Mm -hmm. those pieces and being like, Wow. So I'd love to ask you like in just maintaining this. So is there anything in specific that you do like on a daily basis to like maintain this? Cause I'd love to hear like what you do to do that. Yeah, completely. And it's so, um, it's so appropriate for you to, to bring this up into the conversation because it's not like you kind of flick a switch and, and it's done and, and mm-hmm. you don't revisit it. You know, this, this self, Um, nurturing this relationship with self is a practice you know it's Mm -hmm. like yoga you don't kind of get good at yoga and then tick the box and stop doing yoga right it's something Mm -hmm. you keep doing or for me um, one of my daily practices is meditation mindfulness meditation which is simply um, observing the present moment with no judgment no attachment just observing the present moment so mindfulness meditation has become a daily practice for me each morning before I get get up That's one of the things I do. But in terms of um, nurturing this relationship with self, I've become really aware of the quality of the words that I use in my Mm self-talk, you know, so when we make a mistake or when we don't achieve a goal that we set or when we behave in a way that we are not happy with, like we lose our temper or something like this, after those moments, when you're talking to yourself, what's the quality of your self-talk like? You know, because mm-hmm. quite often we're so horrible to ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, we we swear at ourselves and we t- t- we say that we're idiots and we're stupid and how could you do that? And, you know, and this is, we don't talk to anybody else like that. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't, at least I don't, yeah. don't talk to my kids <laughs> like that or my clients like that. Or, so just there was a step in there of awareness of how do I treat myself? Mm-hmm. And now there's a conscious practice. So I'm a, a massive believer in affirmations. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and I have my, so my morning ritual is 20 minutes of meditation and then five minutes of affirmations. So saying out loud, um, you know, I have a, a self identity affirmation. I'm a kind, caring, generous, thoughtful, loving man. Um, and then I have affirmations to self. And even sometimes, and I know this sounds weird. And when people try this for the first time, they go, Jem, that's really weird. <laughs> I look at my, I look at myself in the mirror. And I hold eye contact with my reflection and really allow myself to see myself. And I'll look at myself in the mirror and go, hey, mate, I love you just the way you are. Wow. You're enough, you know. And people go, oh, yeah, I tried that, Gemma. It was really weird. And I said, I know it is a bit to begin with, but you get over that. And mm-hmm. for me anyway, I don't know if this works for other people, but this is a practice You know, Mm -hmm. I I will always do this. I will always look at myself and say, hey, I love you just the way you are and you're enough. 
you know, and check in with my intentions. If my intentions are good, I'm good. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm waking up in the morning trying to go and do good work and, and make a positive impact in other people's lives, then that's all I need to be doing. Wow. I, I love how you just outline that because I feel like that's so important because I love how you brought up too how you don't just do this work and then, okay, now I'm this person who, you know, I'm like, I'm a coach, I'm an author, I'm a speaker, I'm all these great things and I'm, I'm done. I did the work, I'm done. No, you do it every single day. And I love how you outlined you know, doing that 20 minute meditation, having that five minutes of affirmations, and then also checking in with those intentions, because that's so important to me, because sometimes when I sit here and just for myself, you know, thinking about, you know, why do we do the things we do? Are we, are you doing this because you want others to accept you? Or are you just, are you doing it because you, you genuinely are interested and want to, you know, show support to someone else without thinking, oh, like, okay, if I do this, you know, then maybe you know, they'll do something for me. Right. No, like, that's why I love you bring, bring that up because, you know, I just downloaded, I was sitting here, you know, reading a copy of your, the book, right. What, what matters most. And I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm, I'm going through this and I love how you bring up in, in the book, the eight points you talk about the, the four fund um, foundations of well being. And you talk about that and you talk about physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual and how those all align. So like, especially when you're talking about radical self-acceptance, right? So, you know, for you, like what, what is a common roadblock that you see working with clients or like a common challenge that comes up with a lot of different people when they're trying to learn how to accept themselves? Yeah. Um, I, before I talk about the roadblock, I just want to um, point out that beautiful question that you just Thank brought you. up, Paris, about f why, you know, why am I doing this? And the, the words I use for exactly the same question is for what purpose, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a really lovely thing to check in, isn't it? You know, just to keep checking in with yourself and go, for what purpose am I about to do this? Mm -hmm. Or for what purpose am I going to have this conversation with someone? Or for what purpose am I going to? Yeah, I love that. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, of course. Um, the biggest roadblock really when I'm working with people is, is our ego, our, our mm -hmm. sense of identity, you know, and our ego is stubborn, really, really stubborn. Mm -hmm. And our sense of identity um, is necessarily defensive. So if there's, if there's any alternatives, are op, you know, offered, the ego kind of, you know, stamps at feet and says, no, <laughs> I am the way I am. And we identify with our thoughts and we identify with our emotions. We identify with our physiological state of being and our ego resists change. Mm -hmm. So if you've identified as someone who um, doesn't deserve abundance or success or love or happiness, if that's a part of your identity, it's a really stubborn thing to shift. It takes tenacity. You know, it takes persistence. You know, this neural change that I started to make in my, after my midlife awakening i'm calling it mm -hmm. quote unquote um didn't just like i said before it didn't just happen overnight you know this was repetition really over the course of 12 months a lot like saying it a lot and then since then creating this habitual practice of self-love and self-acceptance so in answer to your question the biggest roadblock is our sense of identity and our ego would think that if we have an identity crisis the ego thinks that's real death I've had two identity crises in my life. You don't die. <laughs> you know, in fact, it's an opportunity. You get, to, you get to reinvent the type of person that you choose to be, you know, and rather than identifying with our vehicles, so rather than identifying as somebody's partner or the job that you do or the hobbies that you have, we can identify as the type of person that we choose to be each day, which is aligned with our values, right? So someone says to me, Jem, who are you? And I say, I'm a kind, caring, compassionate, loving man. That's mm -hmm. who I am. Then there's the other stuff that I experience life through my relationships and my work and my hobbies. But essentially at the core of it, it's, it's who do you choose to be as a person? Mm -hmm. No, I, I love that so much. And especially how you bring up the, not just the ego, but like you said, the sense of identity, because that's so powerful because right, like when you're trying to make any kind of change, especially a change where you're learning 
to love yourself, to accept yourself. That can be so hard, right? When you said you've built up this identity, right? Maybe you may have done this over years and years and years through your thoughts, like you said, through your emotions, through your physiology. And it's hard to really break that. Like you said, because it's challenging what, what your sense of reality is. It's like, and you said, it's almost like you feel like it's almost like a death in, in itself. Um, And I, and I, I mean, so for, for navigating that, right. So when you have um, someone you're working with, or even if it's yourself, right. Navigating that to try to overcome that, right. Like what would you say is like been the most helpful thing you've seen for defeating that ego? Yeah. A couple of things. Look, the first time I went through an identity crisis, you know, a, a kind of death of ego in my late twenties, it was scary as hell. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to a low point at the time I was living in London. Uh, I didn't know who I wanted to be. My teenage sweetheart and and I just broken up. I had a broken heart. Um, You know, there were drugs involved. I was kind of like this punk. I had a mohawk and piercings through my (laughs) face and everywhere. And, and I'd gone from someone who as a teenager was pretty confident to losing all my confidence. You know, I had a stutter, um, you know, when I would go to get on a bus, the bus driver would say, sorry, what did you say? People were, c- couldn't hear me because I was speaking so quietly. I'd lost all my self-assuredness and I didn't know who I was. My sister was my angel at the time and she flew into London and she said, hey, weren't you here saving up money to get back to India? I spent many years loving India. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'd forgotten even who or why I was. Mm. And, and I said, yeah, you're right. So I bought my ticket to India, saved up enough money. And I got back to India and I really Paris, I had no idea who I was, you know, and I didn't Mm. know what I wanted to do. And it was really scary. And so then I ran an experiment and, you know, I said, you know what, I'm not going to have any design on the future at all. I'm not even going to plan tomorrow. I'm just going to wake up each day, meditate, drink chai and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I ran this experiment. And when people would say, because you meet people and they go, oh, hi, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I mean, I was an actor and I'd given that up. So I didn't, I used to say I'm an actor, but Mm -hmm. I didn't have that anymore. People would say, what do you do? And I was like, nothing. Mm -hmm. And that wouldn't fly. So then I said, well, I'm a traveler. I travel, right? That was just to have something to say, but I didn't even want to identify as that. I just didn't know who I was. Mm Anyway, so through it ended up being a wonderful year of wandering around India barefoot and um, it became a massive year of flow. I really, really was lucky enough to, to get into flow and that, that's a whole other story. Mm-hmm. So that was scary. I guess I'm sharing that story for your listeners to know that, yes, it can be really scary, mm-hmm. but you're going to be okay. You know, if you've got breath and you've got access to food and water and shelter, you're going to be okay right? And in those scary moments of not really knowing who you are or what you're here to do or where the meaning is to your life, just just surrender to the not knowing. Mm -hmm. Because when you do that, you're creating space for something intuitive to drop in, for something inspirational to just drop in, you know, and it doesn't need to be some kind of aha moment, (laughs) you know, it can just be little, little glimpses of, uh, you know, a, a feeling, a motivation to do this thing. You know, how can I help somebody somewhere, you know, and just gently trust that breathe, eat good food, drink water. And if you've got shelter, just trust you'll be okay. So that was the first identity crisis. The second time it happened, I was kind of not so scared because I went, I've been through this before. I can do this. And so it was more conscious. I had more Mm -hmm. volition around it. I went, right. I don't know who I am right now. I know I'm these boys father. That was Mm -hmm. it. And I know that I'm my mum's son. My dad and my youngest brother had both died. So I've been through the grief of that. But then I went, you know what? I get to reinvent. So, Jem, who do you want to be? You get to choose this. You know, you can choose the sense of identity and no one comes and knocks on your door and says, no, 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 you're not allowed to be that person. You get to choose, right? So I started saying out loud every day, I'm kind. I'm generous. I'm loving. The things that I wanted to be, I just started putting it on vibration. These, these affirmations, just saying it every day. And now Paris, if you ask me who I am, that's who I think I am. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. so, that's amazing. That's just like, and just hearing it from you, like in your, in your personal story and like, you know, over, overcoming these, 
you know, the, like the two really d- devastating times in your life that you shared and what's been helpful. It's just so awesome to be able to like hear that and just, you know, how you completely shifted from this place where you're like, I have no idea who I am anymore. I don't know what to say because I've had that. I've had, you know, when people come up to me, you know, and I feel like we all, all of us have, have had this moment, you know, a transitional moment. We all have those in our life. So when someone's like, Hey, you know, what are you doing? And maybe you don't, you're like, I don't know what to say. I don't really think I do anything. I don't know. I'm not. And you feel like you don't know what to say. You know, that's, I love how you bring up, you know, the fact that you're breathing, you have food, water, shelter, because we always, I feel like a lot of people, we forget these basic foundations because we're so focused on, okay, what's next. Okay. What do I do next? I want to do this. I want to go here. I need to do this. I need to be better. I need to, you know, I, it's always like, nothing's ever enough. It's never enough. And then even when you get that thing, there's another thing you want. And then there's another thing you want. You're never like here present, appreciating it. And I love that you bring that back to reality and such an amazing message. And that brings me to, you know, something I'd love to, I always ask everyone this question and I always, it's always such a different answer and it's so cool. So, um, of course I have to ask you gem this question. So what are you currently doing right now in this moment to master your mental? I've mentioned it to you already in our conversation, but I have to say it again, (laughs) because this is my truth. It's mindfulness meditation Mm -hmm. and integrated mindfulness. So integrated mindfulness is just um, integrating the practice of mindfulness and attention to the present moment into things that you're already ordinarily doing anyway. So you can practice mindfulness while you're brushing your teeth. Mm -hmm. You can practice mindfulness while you're listening to someone. That's a beautiful thing to do because when you are completely present, listening to somebody and they can feel it, right? Us humans, we're super sensitive. And the person who's speaking, when they feel that you are completely present for them, their ability to communicate elevates. Mm -hmm. They become more eloquent. They, 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 you know, and the converse happens if you're kind of pretending to listen, but you're thinking about what you want to say next, or you're thinking about what you're cooking for dinner that night, the person communicating feels it and they start to kind of trip over their words a bit. Mm -hmm. So the art of listening as a mindfulness practice is a really beautiful thing to do, but you can, you can integrate mindfulness into anything. You can integrate mindfulness into sipping on a glass of water, Mm -hmm. you know, which is just taking all of your attention to the present moment. Wow. So mindfulness is a, is a, a massive thing for me. Yeah, no, that's, that's so important. I, and I love how you put that. Cause I've never actually heard it that way before. When you said integrated mindfulness, because when you think about that, like the example you brought up, you know, of the conversation and you know how sometimes we're all, we're all, what are we doing? Like checking our emails, look at this message I just got, or like what's going on over here. And sometimes it's, it's very hard to sometimes be fully present. Cause we're always, okay, what's next? You're like, what's for dinner? you know, what am I doing after this? Like it's always the next thing or whatever. So when you can actually have awareness of, okay, you know, this is what this person's talking about and like fully give them your undivided attention is amazing. And I love that example. It's so cool. Um, but you know, I just honestly want to say thank you to you, Jem, just for like taking the time to come out here on master your mental and share these experiences. This has been amazing. Just hearing your story and like all of the value that you've gained literally from going through things that are very, very challenging. And most people would just really don't know how to navigate that. They don't know how to come out of it. They don't know what to do. And it's very easy to give up and to, and to just stop trying. So you, your story, your life is a complete Testament to how that's possible. And that's what I'm all about here on master your mental is showing these stories, these solutions, and you are just such an incredible human being. So I just, again, just thank you so much for doing everything you're doing and helping all the people you're helping and just contributing so much value. It's seriously so incredible. Wow. I'm going to have to mirror that back to you. Thank you so much for everything you just said, Paris. I received that um, with a big open heart. And I would like to also mirror, like I said, I've been listening to your podcast. I only found out about you the other day. And I want to say thank you to you because you're dedicating so much time helping people and, you know, doing what you can 
to, to help inspire people and give them tools and strategies to make their lives better. So yay you, Paris. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, you guys. So whether you're listening during the daytime or the nighttime, I hope that you guys have an awesome rest of the day or rest of the night. And I'm going to end it on that note and say bye to you guys and bye to Jim. So bye guys and bye, Jim. Bye. Bye, Paris. Bye, everyone.